tuberculosis. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the person he was really attached to. Well, we're ready to get started. Okay. Uh, so it's it's your fair, so whatever okay. you want to do, well, we can do. You can just, uh, let's just uh, put those aside for right now. And uh, I'll let's just put them right there. Best place to start is at the beginning. Let's do right. this chronologically. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's tell, tell us about your, you know, you have to assume that, uh, I know a little bit about this, but the average, but the person mm -hmm. who's watching doesn't know. And uh, where did you, where did you begin life in Illinois? Uh, as we discussed, I'm a product of Southern Illinois and from an immigrant family in the coal fields of Southern Illinois. I was born in Franklin County in a little place called Ziegler, Illinois, in 1928. And uh, I remember the place quite well because I was in the third grade when we moved during the Depression, 1936, to Madison County. It was the core of the Depression, a poor area because of the coal fields and uh, the kind of economy. And actually, it, we're talking about a time, I don't remember who was president when, when I was born. I don't remember when Roosevelt was elected, maybe a little bit later. But I remember how excited people were about Roosevelt because they were destitute and, and life was very difficult for them. I didn't, I didn't realize that we were poor because the kind of circumstance I came out of, uh, my family, my dad was hard working, but all of the Slavic coal miners were heavy drinkers. So sometimes they got damn good and drunk, and, uh, uh, and, and that can be a problem. But my mother was very thrifty, and from gardening, from just the methods of, of life and so forth, we were always well fed, and we were well clothed, but not well clothed relative to the way people are today. Uh, we played in, in patched up clothes. We went barefoot. Uh, you, you know, the coal fields were, uh, everybody was in trouble in a certain ex to a certain extent because uh, there were labor problems. As you know, Southern Illinois was rife with certain kinds of labor problems. Uh, there were other kinds of problems relative to uh, uh, immigrants um, having their difficulties coming into an English-speaking society, but English-speaking people many times uh, uh, almost hillbilly people not understanding immigrants, and so there were clashes of cultures. In fact, uh, I can remember being in some pretty bl bloody battles with some kids on the streets of, of Ziegler calling me hunky, 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 and uh, that leading to some fighting when we're going back and forth to school. Uh, so, so Southern Illinois was sort of a special and a different place and, and very bad economic conditions. So uh, we left essentially to improve our life. My dad had gotten work in Montana. Now in the 30s, early 30s in Montana, you, to get there, he had to make his way from uh, Ziegler to St. Louis and somehow or another then get on a bus, probably with a pint of whiskey, and, and I don't know how many days it would take him to travel out to Montana. How he found out there was a job in Montana, I don't know. But then he would send us uh, money from Montana, and as soon as I was in the first grade, I had more education than my parents. So my mother would hand me a tablet and a pencil and, and say, write to your dad. And she'd dictate, and I would write, and, uh, and we communicated with one another, however we did. Uh, in other words, you see, just a little bit of school was considered enough to, to make it possible for you to function, particularly for people that had no prior schooling. So everything, when I look back, was on a really primitive, uh, somehow or another, make your own existence kind of level. Uh, and, and so then, when it looked like maybe we should move, he thought about it and decided that Montana in the winter was too cold for me and my sister that we were little. And uh, so he heard from some Italian coal miners that in the Madison County they were opening up a mine. And if you had some money, you could invest in that mine and then go dig coal there. So that took us in 1936 from Franklin County to Madison County. And then equally tough times, but in a different area because the St. Louis area has 
more variety of economy. And somehow or another, we survived that phase of our lives until the war started. Then mining picked up. And, and then the circumstance for life in that area improved. Uh, there's, there's just a lot of, of American Illinois history that's involved in all that if, if I try to cut through all of it in a hurry. But for us, it was an economic thing. You know, Southern Illinois was just not, not viable if you wanted to live and thrive. And, and we had to leave, in a sense, or else just wind up on, on relief. It wasn't relief then. It was, uh, no, it, w it was relief. It wasn't welfare. It, w it was relief. And uh, they had sort of figured out that my mother must have had some money squirreled away somewhere, and they wouldn't give my dad WPA. He had tried to get WPA, but he couldn't get on it. Now, see, later in later life, I thought about this. I asked you about uh, Paul Simon. We had another senator from up north, Percy. And I remember reading somewhere that Percy's family was on relief at some point. Our family went, never was on relief, even though my parents had, did not have one day of schooling. We never were on relief. What kind of, uh, what kind of sense of, or set of ethics did they give you uh, to, to, uh, to, to make you pursue education? Uh, well, education was always considered by them the ultimate goal, that that was their salvation. That was the same. See, in Europe, in Europe where they came from, they were under foreign rule. And Hungarian, the Hungarians were in control of their government. And, but they're, these are not uh, Hungarian people. These are Slavic-speaking people. And they could see that the clergy and the government people had education, and they didn't. The peasants were supposed to serve the others. And they could see that they were handicapped for not having access to the written word. In fact, when I was a school kid, my dad wanted me in the summer to go learn Russian from the Russian Orthodox priest. As you guys know, you're from Southern Illinois and you see a, a little Orthodox church. Uh, a lot of Americans don't even know what an Onion Dome church is, but, but in Royalton there was such a church which was our church. And my dad wanted me to go learn because he knew that the priest had uh, advanced education. And he knew that there existed such a thing as literature and a higher form of the language. And, and I remember resisting that because I'm growing up on the streets with English-speaking kids. And no, we don't need that. No, I don't want to waste my time with it. Then later, I came to regret it because I found it would have been useful for me to have a more advanced knowledge of, of, of a Slavic language, particularly Russian, since it's the biggest. Slav the Slavic language. What were the subjects in school that inter interested you? Well, in, in Ziegler, it was just reading, writing, and arithmetic in a sense. And actually, in Glen Carbon, it was a similar kind of thing in the beginning. But I found myself gravitating more and more and more towards uh, quantitative sciences, arithmetic, and, and mathematics, particularly when I went from grade school to high school, uh, and also science courses were more and more intriguing. I, uh, during the war, during World War II, uh, my wife tells me that in Chicago they closed down certain languages, like for example German. But in Edwardsville High School we could, we could study Spanish, Latin, French, and German. German was not foreclosed from Edwardsville High School. And some people studied languages. I started with Latin, and then I thought, no, I already know a foreign language. I know one from home. So I didn't spend any time particularly with languages because I already knew one, uh, another one besides English. And uh, I found that I liked what was going on in the mathematics classes and, and algebra and geometry and, and all of that sort of stuff. We weren't as advanced as they are now. They didn't go to the point of calculus, but we did all the other ones. Uh, and, and when I came here to the university, I found that as far as the math background was concerned, I probably had a better background than the people I was competing with. How did you go from being the son of coal miners, immigrant parents, to coming to the University of Illinois? Uh, that was going to the University of Illinois was a, was a trickier thing. Uh, coming from a working family, I always felt that I didn't have the right to essentially spend my parents' money. 
So we were always trying to make money on the side. Even in Ziegler, I can remember looking for junk with other kids and selling junk. And in Glen Carbon, we were always doing that. And during the war, gathering paper and junk. And then there was a country club not far away, and I caddied there. Then later, I, um, I, uh, I worked on their course, cutting the grass and working around on the place. And, and it's the war. And adjacent to us is Granite City and, and, and places where you could go into war plants. So I go with the other kids trying to get in there, and I lied about my age and claimed I was 16. I wasn't, and they checked up on me and found I was underage, so they wouldn't give me a job there. But the railroad needed labor, and the railroad didn't check up as well, and I lied about my age. I was 15 and claimed I was 16. So that I worked on an extra gang, and when the extra gang left, they put me on the local section crew. We were working 10 hours a day, six days a week for 65 cents an hour, uh, digging in ties. Everything was done by hand. And I was putting all of that aside. My, my family was thrifty, particularly my mother. And I saved every, all of my earnings. So uh, I worked the summer of 44, 45, 46, and school holidays on the Illinois Central Railroad. And that turned out to give me troubles later because I overloaded my back and at some point much later slipped the disc and got into other trouble. But uh, the money I had put aside turned out to be the money that I used to go to college. And the last summer that I was on the Illinois Central, we had a big washout, a huge washout. And if you didn't have family to bring you food, you could just sit there and starve and work, starve and work. And so when we're done with repairing the track and rebuilding this washout for something like 30 hours of continuous work, I thought, I don't want to do this forever. So I heard that the University of Illinois was opening an extension center in Granite City. So I decided I'd better go look into that. So I went to this extension center and enrolled. And so I, went, I stayed at home and went back and forth and commuted. In my first year in college, I was at that extension center. I didn't really plan to go to college. I had a scholarship from Shirtliff or somewhere, and, and, and that was a, a minor sort of thing. And so uh, I came from a family that didn't know anything about college. And so consequently, it was sort of an accident of the timing, the war closing, extension centers being opened up, a convenient one nearby. And so I felt it was quite natural to stay in school. It seemed to me unnatural every fall to not be in school. And so it was sort of accidental, in a sense, that I wound up in school. In fact, uh, uh, my, my dad said, well, you've got a job now. Why don't you just keep working? Because America has times when it doesn't work. The whistle of the mind doesn't blow. There's no work. And so, so while, you're, while you got work, work and put the money aside. When there's no work, then you go to school. My mother's reaction was, no, these kids are very good learners, and they should keep going to school. So that's what, what did it. How did you come to meet John Bardeen? Uh, I met John Bardeen later. And, uh, when I got into school here and got into electronics, a, a friend of mine, a, a professor, wanted me to study chemistry. And I thought, no. Nah, Chemistry is sort of cookbookish, and I'm interested in electrical things. I had played around with Model T Ford spark coils and with um, uh, electric bells and things like this stuff that you could scrounge, and, and that intrigued me much more. So even though I knew I was at a disadvantage with all the returning GIs who had had radar experience and stuff like that, I sort of figured that I had a better academic background and math background, and that I could compete with them. And that turned out to be right. I could catch them. And uh, by the time I was a senior, I realized that I'm just scratching the surface of this. In fact, my dad asked me what I was studying. And, and when I explained it to him, because this poor man has no formal education, and when I explained to him, he, in his language, says to me, oh, I don't think that was a good idea. He says, I have some money put aside. And he s said, I thought. Uh, in, his, in his language, he says that you'll be like 
Yevrei, you know, those are Jews, he says, they, they're, they're enterprising and they make a geschäft. A geschäft is a, a German word meaning business. And that you'd, you'd have some ability to, to take this money and set up a business and we wouldn't work so damn hard. And uh, I said, no, I'm interested in science and so forth. And so when I got my bachelor's degree, I could get an assistantship. And the assistantship would let me pay not out of a bank account anymore, but out of earnings. And so I wound up here as an assistant at first teaching, but then I got in a group that was doing microwave tube research. And just about that time, Bardeen came from industry in the fall of 1951. So I took one course from him on atomic physics, and then he was teaching a transistor course. It was maybe the first transistor course ever taught in a university, ever probably. And I took that, and I heard that he's opening a laboratory, and I decided I'm learning more from this man than from anyone else, so I'm going to look into this. And he also spoke to the professor I was working for who had a lot of students, and, and the other professor was agreeable, and, and John knew that I had some lab background and could come into his lab and, and have some lab experience already and help out. And so I got into business of what turned semiconductor research, but it was because of the transistor. The people I was leaving thought I was making a big mistake. They, they thought, well, you know, this is like a crystal set radio that you're talking about. And that's nothing. It's vacuum tubes that do everything. And you know how to do electronics that way and so forth. Stay with us. And my reaction was, no, this other thing looks intriguing to me. It turned out to be a, a revolution. And, and, and at See, there's an element always in here of either luck or accident, but partly being ready to gamble on something and being prepared to do something in a different area. The opportunity is funny because if you're not ready for it, it won't happen. But there still is an element of luck and opportunity. What was it like working with Bardeen here? It was, uh, to me, as I look back and I think about it and so forth, see, John was, uh, some people called him Whispering John, Silent John, and all that, and in and, and, uh, social occasions, some people would say, he's difficult to talk to, and, and he's sort of silent and all that. I didn't find him that way at all. I was, I learned very rapidly watching him with his Bell Labs partner who would come to visit, and John talking to his wife, that when they wanted to communicate with John, they just came right at him, and and that's what I do. I was never embarrassed to ask him a question or to uh, uh, try an idea on him or something because he knew that I was not, um, I wasn't testing him or uh, playing a game with him or anything. I was genuinely trying to find out something. So I found it easy to talk and 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 to relate to him. Other people apparently, in many cases, found it difficult because. He, he was he was the kind of guy that if you came into his office and you talked to him, he might sit there a little bit and he, and you ask him something and he might hesitate for a while. And then you think he's not going to answer and he's suddenly talking and telling you something. Mm -hmm. And when you get when you sense that you're at the end of a conversation, in the army you salute and and you leave. In John's case you're wondering when do I salute, you know, and, 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 and leave. And, uh, but I never had a problem with that. He and I were able to uh, communicate easily to one, with one another. You had... Uh, Why don't you open me five seconds? Four, three, two, one, and go. Okay. Oh, incidentally, uh, when John came here, and I was already a grad student, and already comfortable in the laboratory. There were two postdocs and two of us who were his first grad students. Uh, you could sense that he was special, that he was different from the others. In other words, what he would focus on, what he wouldn't focus on, what he would uh, dwell on as important versus unimportant. He wasn't vituperative or caustic or cynical or anything like that. It's just that you began, I, I studied to see why he was going to the left instead of to the right, why he was focusing on one problem instead of another problem. That fascinated me. And 
you could tell, even though he didn't have uh, big awards yet, there were some, but you could tell this man is going to be extremely famous. And see, it's later. I've already got my PhD. I've already worked a year at Bell Labs. I'm in the Army in Japan, and, and the lieutenant comes in with the mail, and he says, Nick, who the hell do you know in, in Sweden by the name of John? Well, Bardeen had sent me a card from the Nobel ceremony getting the, the first Nobel Prize, which dealt with the transistor. And, and, uh, and, and I, I don't think it was a surprise to those of us who knew him that there would be a second Nobel Prize. Uh, the, but you could tell, I could tell from the beginning that this man is not the usual person. That he's special. What, with that special, is what, how did that inspire you to do what well, you did? Well, I, I think what that does to you is you play a bigger, better game when you see a bigger, better game. And, and, and uh, you know, in Tennessee, Ernie, Ford was singing 16 ton, and what do you get? Another day older and another day in debt. I can remember my dad saying, he not much coal miner. He says, uh, we, we dig, he says, 25, 30 ton coal, you know, load out coal. He says, that not much coal miner. You see, it's the same thing as digging coal. You, you, he knew the difference between a real coal miner and somebody that's, uh, you know, sort of a half-assed coal miner. The, 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 you could tell that John was, was it, figuring things out bigger time than other people, that his talent was richer, deeper, and that there is an issue of judgment. Why do you work on some problems and not other problems? Where are payoff problems? I don't think what you do is you do this the same way as investors and say, how can I, am I a banker? I want to, I want to stick a million bucks in here and I want 10 million by such and such time. You're not doing it that way. You're doing it a different way. You're looking at, at what ideas are worth and which ideas have potential, which ideas don't. Where, where you can look for something for good reason and where it's, it's going to be minor kinds of things that you're going to do. It'll be productive, that you're, the stuff you're talking about, but it's not going to yield uh, anything of, of major scope. John was a guy that you had confidence was thinking and, and examining problems from a different point of view. Building on that, then how did that perhaps influence you as you went on to work on your own... Uh, well, I think it makes you things. more of a... I think it gives you more depth. I think you become more of an explorer. I think you, your taste changes relative to what is worth something and what isn't worth something, uh, isn't worth much. I, I think it just... Uh, it's what I said, that after you knock a home run, you realize you can hit a home run after you understand what that is. After you see that you can do something uh, creative, you will do something further creative. I think one of the big problems is getting students to the point where they know enough to be able to do something and then do something and realize, and give, which will give them some confidence. You don't have to learn everything to be able to do something. And you've got to get to the point where you have enough in your toolbox that you can work with. Then you've got to start exploring and seeing what kind of problems are out there that you can contribute to. And then you have to be thinking and selecting and, and, and looking for something. Well, for example, when I went in the Bardeen's lab, I could have joined ILIAC project, which was one of the big supercomputers. It was one of the first ones. Uh, my life would have been totally different had I gone in that direction. But I couldn't have pursued ILIAC forever because ILIAC and, and universities working on big computers finally died. And what was changing the world was, in fact, this little device with the little wires on it that was making, letting you build a whole circuit inside of a slab of material and, and more and more wondrous things. There, there's, as I said, there's an accident in this, but there's something more than accident. There's the potential of seeing, is there, it's like looking at a piece of wood and you're a carver, and you see something in that piece of wood that other people don't see. You see something you're going to make out of that. Mm -hmm. and, and you see, when the semiconductor came along, it looked to me, uh-oh, this is a place where I can do something that I couldn't do with anything else. It, 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 there's a chance to explore, and, and that's an opportunity. And of course, the first big thing that comes out of it uh, in your work at General Electric is the light emitting diode. Well, actually something came before that. 
I, I have in a box, I have a, 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 an item which is the transistor had peculiarities and you chase back through those ideas and so forth. You come up with a thing called a PNPN switch. And when you go into that and go into silicon and start making these things, and I was part of the group that made the first ones, you make the kind of thing which is now the control element and trigger control drills, wall light dimmers, and that type of thing. And so uh, I'm the only one that worked on some of those first devices at, at Bell Labs and at GE, at General Electric. And at General Electric, I figured out with a partner how to make this thing switch in both directions. Uh, Dave doing the filming there probably has a, a flash lamp in there somewhere that you can pulse, and it's run with a thyristor. I'm talking about the thyristor. So some of my first work dealt with thyristors and thyristor inventions and, and improvements of various kinds, and that led me into some further work that led me in the direction of the light-emitting diode. It actually led me into laser work, which led me into the light-emitting diode. Uh, one problem will frequently teach you something about how to go into the next problem. And, 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 and then once it starts, you just you keep pursuing it. What is so interesting about the light emitting diode? Why is it so m uh, much more efficient? How is it different, let's well, say, than the old incandescent lights we all grew up with? Back, back when we first got into this, uh, I was a little bit worried that, that maybe we're going down the wrong direction and fundamentally maybe this is a good light emitter but can be superseded. But somewhere along the way I started thinking about this some more and by the time, uh, I didn't get very far into this, but uh, by the time we got to a semiconductor laser which was 1962, I realized that this thing is much more powerful. And so I started thinking about a simple argument that uh, I didn't publish in the beginning. I knew it, and I taught it to students, that starting with just a piece of semiconductor, I could prove that if I put light in, that was going to be the energy that would uh, um, excite that piece of material. And if the material didn't uh, dissipate the energy, that I should be able to return it as light out. So I... I devised a fundamental argument that said I can probe this material with light in to see if I can turn it around and get light out equal to what I got in. And there's a fundamental argument that lets you uh, attack that. And then in the argument you come to the point where you say, well now I don't want to use light in, I want to put a current in. So what do I have to do? And so when you trace through the argument, you find out I have to make a thing called a PN junction, which is part of the transistor world. So when I got to that stage, I realized, uh-oh, I have a proof that what we're talking about is an ultimate lamp because it's, in principle, 100% efficient. Now, in practice, nothing is. You've got losses. You've got resistive losses, conductive losses, heat, heat problems, and all that. And so you have to cope with that. But in principle, the semiconductor LED is an ultimate lamp, and you can prove it. And so I've gone through that proof a couple of times, and in fact, I just had something published where I rewrote that because I didn't want to lead people in that direction and then have them look at me and say, you know what? This thing is no good. It can be superseded. You could come in here today and say, I'm an organic chemist and we got a way to make this material conductive and I can make it produce light. And I would turn around and tell you, you can make it produce light perhaps, but you will never make it better than the semiconductor light emitting diode and, it, and your lamp will never be better than the lamp I'm talking about, which is an ultimate lamp. In other words, in principle, the one I'm talking about is 100% efficient. And in some forms, you can. I, I showed you some stuff upstairs that's 50 to 60 percent external quantum efficiency. Now, when you're within a factor of two, you know you're fighting practicalities. You're fighting losses, heat, contacts, things like this. But you're not fighting principle. Principle is there. How close are we uh, to that? Well, on. Oops. Can we get down? Uh, are we going? Are we? Uh, four, three, two. Okay. We're, 
we're close and not close. In in some of these systems, they are very efficient and are close. In a practical sense, however, we don't know how at low enough cost to make them big enough, uh, uh, low enough in cost so that you can just replace bigger and bigger and bigger lands. And certain special app applications already, they exceed every other source. But now we don't have them at all power levels. For example, all of the rear lighting and signal lighting and all that on a car, you can do it now with LED lamps. The headlight is still a little bit of a problem simply because of the size, because you've got to run uh, bigger currents, which means uh, bigger mounting structure, more heat loss, and things like that. So you still have to find ways to make bigger crystals uh, uh, more cheaply to be able to make them cost efficient with uh, stuff that is already here but and hard to displace. But th that's happening. And see, I won't live long enough to see the semiconductor, the LED, replace all existing lighting, but it's happening. And, and on the scale of like a logarithmic scale, 10 years, double it 20 years, double it again past 40 to 50, 100, it's happening. And the semiconductor lamp is going to prevail all the way. Are you, are you surprised by all the uses that it's been put to up to this point? Sure, because I don't care. I, I'm sure I'm surprised uh, because even if you see a certain amount of it coming, you can't you can't usurp uh, human minds and their imagination and all that. And there's a lot of clever people out there, and they think of uses that you never think of. Uh, a guy called me up from Florida uh, a couple of years ago, and he says there's an interesting thing about these turtles coming uh, ashore to lay eggs and certain kinds of light w will spook them, but other kinds of light that we can get with uh, LEDs, don't, that kind of light doesn't spook them, and consequently you can study them coming in and out. And uh, uh, scientists in Japan 10 years ago, I was getting the Japan Prize, and the issue came up of, of certain spectral regions being more favorable for growing certain kinds of things. And I mentioned to him, well, yeah, I'm, I'm sure LEDs are going to do that, and sure enough, Someone gave me a picture not long ago of a publication showing uh, some um, plant scientists growing lettuce on a faster cycle and uh, in, in artificial circumstances, and they could grow lettuce faster and faster and faster by giving, uh, using certain kinds of LED lighting. I don't know how many possible applications are out there, all kinds. And, and that's human creativity, and that's the other guy and his ability to add something and add something and add something. And I, and I, can't, I can't foresee all of that. I don't even think about all those problems. And, and there they are. People are doing these things, and which is nice. One thing I didn't ask you is, for a layman, how would you explain to a, a layperson how an LED works? The, a semiconductor that's used for transistors is an interesting thing. A piece of copper wire conducts with just electrons bumping along. I, I, I put a charge in one end and it bumps, 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 bumps and pops out the other end. In a semiconductor, there's another entity. The electron is doing that and then also in the structure of the semiconductor there are bonds holding the crystal together and, and there are electrons in there and all of those bonds are filled and if I take an electron out of one of those, I leave a void, a thing called a hole that's positive and that thing bumps along and conducts. So inside a semiconductor, I got two things that conduct. I got an electron and I got this hole. The hole isn't real out here in the world, but it's real in the semiconductor. And, and I got two kinds of conducting entities. Uh-oh, I've got now more flexibility that leads me to be able to make transistors. Now also, where the electron sits in energy is above the hole by an amount of energy corresponding to a photon, a light particle. So here's this amazing substance that can be used to play electronic games with an electron, with a hole, and with a photon. Uh-oh. Now I can bump electrons and holes along and convert them into photons, and that drives an LED, or that drives a laser. Or I can turn it around and have a photon come in and have a solar cell or a CCD or that type of thing. 
So it's a it's a much more general material to play uh, conductivity in, electron hole, and so forth. And you know that's an interesting question because if you ask me about Bardeen and say why was he so successful, he wasn't one dimensional, but he was smart. He used over and over certain powerful principles, and he was probably the greatest scientist ever to work on the quantum theory of the conductivity of solids. And it's conductivity, electrons bumping along, holes bumping along, that make things possible in the world of electronics. And see, John was a master of playing with those ideas. And, and the rest of us are masters at how to make those materials and make electronics out of it and that type of thing. In other words, you're, I cannot come out here where they're tearing up the building, pour concrete, and tell these guys now how to do concrete and steel and stuff like that. That's someone else's game. So I stick pretty close to something that I know about because then I can be powerful. It's just like a ball player. They're not necessarily a good catcher isn't necessarily a good pitcher. How did them? Uh, how did? How did, you worked in lasers early on mm -hmm. back before. How did that? How did you perfect it so that we could miniaturize it like we do now, so that we can interpret data, we can go back and retrieve digital data? And the, 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 the the semiconductor again is the magic in making things small, because these are dense systems. You've got 10 to 21 or 10 to 22 atoms per cubic centimeter. They're, they're dense, and so. Unlike a gas laser that where the gas atoms are far apart and you amplify over big distances, in a semiconductor you can amplify light over small distances because it's a dense material and you've got a lot of gain. And when you're when you're dumping in electrons and holes with current, you can generate a lot of gain over a small distance. So that means you can generate a lot of light in a small volume. And uh, actually, the first ones were pretty small, but but they weren't. Uh, so forgiving in terms of how well we could make them behave. We had to learn how to layer them properly and dope them with the right chemical elements properly and contact them properly and all that. And that takes time to work all of that out and the science of all that and, and, and inject some further things in there that people talk about now, so-called nanoelectronics and all that. We've been doing that for a long time in semiconductors. And so as you assemble all these things in there, which is a greater and greater amount of sophistication, you get a, a fancier and fancier device and, uh, and more and more performance. And the payoff just keeps happening. There's a certain amount of magic in it, but, uh, but to someone working in it all the time, it doesn't seem like magic. It seems like the, the natural kind of thing to do is to push it further. Yeah, but the uses you're able to put it to, everything from fiber optics and communications to that's true to the CD player in your car. That that that, that part is true. There's a uh, there is a wide variety of wavelengths, energies, sizes. For example, our first ones uh, would put out milliwatts. You can make uh, uh, structures now that put out watts. And now you can bundle them in such a way that you can make a, a powerful uh, laser that can be used for our fabrication reasons and, and cutting reasons and all that. Reason being that light can be focused, uh, coherent light can be focused to extreme dimensions, which means high power densities in small areas, which means uh, you, you can do fancy kinds of things because of that. So it all turns out to be the magic of the semiconductor in many ways. and. And our ability to stack these materials, grow these materials, process these materials, contact these materials, devise them with certain properties, and, and, and that hasn't been exhausted. Uh, there's still uh, games to play there. In fact, uh, we're, we're in some new work right now that uh, is just further aspects of this. What, what drives you to keep well, <laughs> you know, you're asking good questions. Uh, uh, because of how I started in life and the mistakes I made, my body says, you know, it's, it can't do what it did before. And, uh, but my mind is still restless and still sees problems and things to do. And uh, fortunately, these young people are handier with some of the tools and the methods and the computers and all that. But the experience and other knowledge, and then 
I guess it's how we differ from one another with imagination and that type of thing. So I have never run out of things to do. Uh, and my, my, my mind keeps working, my body complains, but my mind works. What about teaching? Teaching was a fascination for me, and, and, and my wife says, well, you're always explaining something, so you ought to be a teacher, <laughs> because sometimes she complains, shorten it. Uh, but uh, I find that I never like to go to class unprepared, so that takes time. And now, I, as my time gets shorter, I look at it and say, no, I've got something else to do, which is the creative work, and, so, and I've got things to write, so I don't have time to do everything. The, the, as far as the teaching itself is concerned, I find myself teaching on a one-to-one -one basis with a colleague or with a, a grad student or with a postdoc, and uh, but I don't particularly look forward to going to class anymore because I don't have the time. It isn't the inclination; it's the matter of the time. You know, I've only I've only talked to you a few times, you know, in the working up to this this, this interview, but you seem like you're just having a heck of a lot of fun. Th that element I should have mentioned earlier. I don't think you should be doing what you're doing unless there's some fun, unless there's some excitement. Uh, I keep telling the students and others the story that uh, when we made, two groups made the semiconductor laser first at General Electric. My colleague Hall in Schenectady, where the research lab exists, and I'm 120 or so miles away in Syracuse, and I'm working with a visible spectrum material. He's working with an infrared material. and. When that happened, he beat me by a week or so. Uh, at about the time that was happening, John Bardeen called me from here to come and give a seminar. And I thought, even though this is a secret project in a sense, and where we are at General Electric, it's Bardeen, and he's cleared for the White House and all that, and so and he's, he's my mentor and so forth. I'm going to tell him. So I said, John, if you wait a little while. I'll give you a real good seminar because GE will turn this lo thing loose and, and I said, we're running a semiconductor laser. And then the conversation changed. Actually, John had thought about this, I found out later. And, and the famous von Neumann who was involved in World War II atomic energy and computers and all that. But they never came close to being able to realize it. And so it's later and I've given a seminar and all that and Bardeen asked, he's on the East Coast at a special meeting and he asked for, to stop in Syracuse on a Saturday to see my laser. Now, why would John Bardeen, a man that already has one Nobel Prize, want to stop in Syracuse to see a semiconductor laser? You see, it's this thing you're talking about. It's curiosity and the element of fun. This guy has thought about this. And here of all people, his former student has one of the first semiconductor lasers on Earth. John wants to see it because he, he knows there's an element in there of exploration, of fun, of curiosity. And I think that's part of all of this all the time, that you're working to see something. Maybe someone else is right next to you in some other place, you know, a thousand miles away, but maybe not. Maybe you're the first person seeing something. When we're seeing, you see, why I'm talking about LEDs is my lasers some of the other lasers are the first ones you can see with your eye, that the camera can see directly without special instruments. And there's a fun element in that. There's always a fun element in, in uncovering an idea and finding something that works and something that has more prospect than just the first finding. Because generally you think ahead a little bit and, and are working in an area where you think there's more than one, one aspect to this. If I find one nugget in the stream, I'm probably going to find a place where there's many nuggets. And so th there's something like dope about that that's drawing you and pulling you. You never, you never forget how that works. That's a good point. I think we might want to end there, actually, okay. in this part of what we're, what we're doing. Um, one final question. What, uh, what was your reaction when you were told that uh, you were nominated for the Lincoln Award? Well, you know, I'm gonna t I've had a lot of good awards, big awards, and all that. And see, you recognize right away that that's a very important award. And then I don't care if you've had other awards. You have no right of expectation of another one. That's a gift. That's an, uh, something that someone is being kind and, and giving to you. So obviously, you, you, there's a special feeling. 
and uh, I mean, I've, I'm lucky. I've had some nice things happen to me, and that's another one of the nice things. And, and uh, uh, but then the real moment is the moment when you're in the lab and you've found something. That's where the real big joy is. The further joy is nice. It's a warm and friendly feeling. It's how people are, are treating you and, 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 and being nice to you and all that. But I wouldn't give away the moment of the discovery itself, of the work. The work is, is really the, is, is the grand thing. This is the nice thing that, uh, that makes you happy and you like it, but uh, it, it wouldn't matter in some ways. It matters, but it doesn't matter. But the work matters first. Very good. Excellent point to end on.